that uh, oh, that uh, over the last ten days uh, we've lost two people in our community that are uh, important in their well in the whole county, but especially in their uh, role as uh, counselors for uh, children and counselors. So the first I'll mention is Megan Bray, of course, from the town of Westville. Only 37 years old, first time counselor, first term counselor, uh, who succumbed to cancer very quickly over, the, over about a month. And the second one is uh, Brian Brazier, long time counselor in the town of Glasgow, uh, and his wife Rose lost their son, Brock, uh, to the drowning uh, about a week ago or a little more than a week ago. Again, about the same age. Both of these uh, people were. We're just young and, and very capable people uh, just getting started with their lives. And uh, this county's going to miss them uh, both greatly, uh, especially their family. So tonight in our thoughts and prayers, uh, please remember the families of Megan and Brock. Okay, we'll have a moment of silence so we may better be able to do the business of the county. Okay, so I'll have a uh, land acknowledgement uh, next. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge that we're on the ancestral territory of the Mi'kmaq people. Uh, and I'd like to thank the Mi'kmaq people of today uh, for uh, helping our ancestors, uh, whether they came uh, here to these lands four years ago or 400 years ago. We are all treaty peace. Okay, so we'll move right on uh, now to the uh, agenda. If uh, that's that out for you, uh, we'll need to uh, approve what somebody's moving the approval. So we we'll won't be here. We might be here. I'll second, but I'd like to add an item. Okay, go ahead and let us know. That is that we uh, uh, let our condolence to this family what things. Okay, so uh, let me see where we're going to put that. Like right after. Uh, I'm going to the page. Okay. Well, that was 10B. Okay. Uh, Go on the letter to uh, this penalty, West Hampton. Right. Okay. Uh, so it's been moved and seconded that we approve the event. Is there any further uh, additions or deletions? Okay. Not uh, hearing any. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Uh, against? Motion carried. All right, are there any emergency resolutions? I think that we need unanimous consent for them to have an emergency resolution. Okay, I'm not seeing any hands, so uh, we'll uh, skip over that one uh, and go directly to our minutes from our July 4th meeting. Are there any uh, errors, omissions, or corrections uh, to those uh, July 4th council meetings? Go ahead, uh, Councilor Wood. Thank you, Mike. This is Bonnie Kinder. I know this on the Motion Watershed Board Member Production. This is page 22 out of 47, and my name is spelled Stone Yankee. Okay, so we'll get the spelling of uh, Councilor Wild's name correct. And uh, is there any other uh, errors, omissions, or corrections to the map? One last time, any errors, corrections, or amendments, omissions to the minutes of July 4th? Hearing none, will declare those minutes uh, correct as presented. Now, tonight, uh, the reason we're meeting at uh, an hour early, uh, there's been requests here several times over the, uh, well, ever since the audit, uh, which I believe has come up for a year before we know it. Uh, November 24th, I believe. Uh, so we requested uh, to have uh, folks here from uh, no source of power because we want to uh, basically try and do everything we possibly can to not have the bad luck to alleviate uh, some uh, we've, we've had, we had people, you know, some people over two weeks and the in my case it was nine days, that was nine days too much for a lot of us. Um, so we're Hoping to hear, and we want to have lots of time here for questions uh, tonight. We did a uh, 
uh, one of the last questions here is that people want to ask on behalf of their residents. So, uh, so with us tonight, uh, I don't know all the positions, but we uh, have, we're very pleased to have six uh, people with no sort of power here tonight. So hopefully the power doesn't go off. <laughs> we'll have anybody you mix it on. Uh, yes, Matt Grover uh, to the far left there has been with us uh, on several meetings. Uh, Paul Dan Rand, uh, working our way across there, yes, left to right, uh, Ross Rankin, Keith O'Callaghan, Emily McNeil, and Dion Hatton. So, uh, thank you, uh, each of you, for being here tonight. And uh, uh, I'm going to turn it over to you folks now uh, because I know you have a presentation. And I'd like to say we'll uh, then move into the question and answer time. Okay, thank you for having us here this evening. Uh, my name is Matt Roper, the Senior Director of Energy Delivery for Nova Scotia Power. And uh, we have a team of people here tonight with us, and uh, hopefully we'll go through our presentation quickly, and then we'll turn to for you to ask any questions, discuss what against them, or we'll sell the question on. Uh, so it is a short presentation, taking the liability very seriously, and uh, that's what we'll touch on. Very good, Matt. Um, yeah, so I'm Paul Andrand. I'm our director of reliability for the Switch Power. And uh, so I'll uh, work through some of the constants uh, in, our, in our slide deck. And uh, my colleague, Keith Callahan, will join me as well. Uh, so if we could uh, move to uh, the next slide, please. Um, we'll, uh, I'll start in with a brief overview of the Switch Power and our power system. Uh, so uh, up the top, we provide electric service to over 530,000 customers across the province. And uh, the energy that our customers depend on is delivered over 32,000 kilometers of transmission and distribution lines. And for context, that's about three round trips to Victoria and back from Melbourne. Uh, there are approximately 500,000 poles across the province as well. Um, we have about 2,200 plus, uh, just over 2,200 dedicated and safety focused employees that uh, support the generation of electricity and the transmission and distribution of that energy to communities across Nova Scotia, including uh, the communities in which our employees live. Okay, move to the next slide. Just a bit of an overview of uh, Nova Scotia Power's investment in reliability. Uh, so we are planning to invest approximately $200 million in our transmission and distribution system this year. Uh, that investment includes the replacement of deteriorated equipment, that happens uh, over time, vegetation management, which we'll be speaking to quite a bit uh, today, and also the upgrading of our system to store apartment in the face of climate change. For context, uh, with respect to investment, our average annual investment in our transmission distribution system for a five year period of 2016 to 2021 is approximately 180. In addition, uh, we are planning to invest an incremental $150 to $160 million over the next five years in system upgrades and vegetation management. And altogether, these investments will aid in improving reliability and communities across the province. Vegetation management or tree trimming, we use those terms interchangeably. Um, 
is an area where we invest a significant amount each year of that overall investment. And that significant investment aligns with trees contacting power lines as being the primary reason for outages across the province. We've been spending about 20 to $25 million each year on tree trimming. And moving forward, we see tree trimming investments at year over year, and they're going to be doubling it over the next five years. For this year in 2023, our investment in pre will be about $32 million and that increase almost $35 million next year. So if we zoom in on the municipality, um, so a few reliability figures here. Uh, there's some historical reliability data on the left. And so since 2018, uh, just uh, about 70% of our customer interruptions, interruptions to power have been caused by tree contacts with power lines, adverse weather events, and loss of supply due to issues with equipment. Uh, and adverse weather and tree contacts together, when we look at those two contributing factors together, were the largest contributor to customer interruptions. And of course, 2022 and 2019 were heavily impacted by Hurricane Skiona and Dorian. And uh, we'll, we have a few more slides uh, further on in the presentation to speak to this uh, more detail. Year to date, on the right, if we zoom in on this year so far, about 80% of all of the customer interruptions uh, here in the municipality so far this year were in January and February. And uh, they were the result of several weather events, primarily uh, some uh, storms in, uh, in January, and we'll speak to the cold weather events in February as well. And uh, also note in June of uh, this year, there was a full feeder outage for almost an hour. That was a lot of that interference on uh, weather substations. Just uh, briefly, the causes of power outages and interruptions. I've spoken to most of these already in terms of adverse weather and increased contacts. Again, this uh, primary ones, uh, some examples of animal interference with the failure as well. And then lastly, what I haven't touched on is vehicle accidents. Uh, so there are vehicle accidents, unfortunately, from time to time, and those uh, can impact uh, the power system and our ability to uh, maintain service. So we move into a little bit more detail on Hurricane Fiona, just to uh, recap uh, that um, significant storm. Um, of note, I guess the starting point, I just draw everybody's attention to the uh, maps on the bottom of the slide. And you can see over the last 20 years since uh, Hurricane Juan in uh, September of 2003, and then we've had a uh, post tropical storm Arthur in July of 2018, and then uh, Hurricane Dorian in September of 19, and of course, Hurricane in September of 2022. What's very interesting about uh, these graphics is that as you as you look at them moving from left to right and then look at the wind speeds at the very bottom, the legend at the bottom of the slide, for example, this gray shaded area that has wind speeds of zero to 79 kilometers per hour, and then the areas in yellow are 80 to 99 kilometers per hour and, and so on. And what's very interesting about this, if we look at Hurricane Juan, for example, there was a large part of the province uh, that was in that gray area, uh, or gray shaded um, area, where, where the winds were not above, um, you know, morning levels at 80 kilometers per hour. Uh, that's, a, that's a key uh, wind speed for us, and that, uh, for example, when the winds are above 80 kilometers per hour, it's not safe for our crews to work. We'll stand down our, our crews, and then they will go back to work to restore Power when the winds come down below 80 kilometers per hour. But what you can see in Hurricane One is there was a segment of the province that was impacted by very high winds and that was very concentrated uh, within HRM and central part of, of uh, the province, but not as much at the uh, extremities of the west and in Breton. We were to now just look at the far right for uh, Hurricane Dorian, for example, and Hurricane Fiona, especially Hurricane Fiona, a significant amount of province was impacted by very high winds, uh, and that's denoted in the red color and uh, the purple color. So uh, you know, high winds of 140 kilometers per hour plus along uh, the eastern floor and into Breton. Significant wind speeds uh, here as well in the municipality in that red range, uh, and all of the province impacted by winds over 80 kilometers per hour. 
Uh, so similar to uh, Dorian, we experienced gusts over 100 kilometers per hour for again very large areas of the province. And it was very large a storm compared with, with other storms, as I mentioned. Uh, and there were also several conditions uh, that coincided during Fiona, which led to a most significant impact in our social powers history with respect to uh, storms. And again, uh, due to the overall size of the storm, the peak wind speeds, and uh, the area of the province that was impacted. Go to the next slide, please. So just zooming in on this a little bit more, I you know mentioned in terms of areas that uh, were the most impacted. So what we see on the right here in this graphic is a comparison of Hurricane Dorian and uh, Fiona. Uh, the yellow bars being Fiona. Uh, Wind speeds are on the vertical axis. And uh, you can see that the three areas of the province that were the most impacted in terms of wind speeds uh, were here in the northeast, so including the county here. Uh, the eastern shore, as I mentioned earlier, and, uh, very uh, high winds as well, and then uh, the eastern part of, of uh, Cape Breton. So here in, in the northeast, uh, if we look at Dorian, for example, uh, you know, wind speeds in uh, just shy of the 100 kilometer per hour range, but then just shy of 140 kilometer per hour range during. First scenario shots, uh, those are all from uh, here uh, from uh, the municipality, and, and just the devastation was uh, significant. Uh, everybody here is well aware of that, but just looking at these, certainly. Uh, uh, definitely paints that, that picture in terms of the number of trees that uh, fell during Hurricane Fiona and just the damage that was uh, sustained, and also damage sustained to the power system and the challenges associated with restoration over the course of Fiona and aftermath of Fiona and the switch of power removed over 10,000 trees uh, across across the province. Come to the next slide, please. That was Fiona. The next uh, piece that I'd like to jump into is the cold weather event in February, just to share some context about that and uh, a lot of the work that was done by Nova Scotia Power to prepare and respond for it. And uh, to start to believe, I guess, in the next one, some of what we have now to bring us back to that day in February, extremely cold weather, as you can see here in the top right of, of this graphic. Uh, certainly, records uh, were set. Um, minus 42 reported in. Halifax, uh, the old record was minus 41 in February of 1967. So it's been a very long time since we saw temperatures uh, this cold um, across uh, the province and uh, in fact, across Atlantic Canada. And I'll speak to that in a few moments as well. But we'd like to share just some context in terms of uh, the cross functional team uh, that uh, the Special Power assembled from a number of different areas across the business uh, to uh, prepare for this cold weather event uh, and so uh, that work was done well in advance uh, we certainly follow weather to understand what's, what's coming um, and uh, those weather forecasts consistently predicted strong winds and temperatures reaching minus 24 to minus 27 and in fact we saw temperatures uh, much, much colder than that in advance of uh, that cold weather event um, we, we had an operations coordination center that was established and that is very similar to the approach that uh, we would take directly in the storm uh, establish our emergency operations center. So a bunch of employees from across the business um, established again in that operations coordination center. Uh, and that involved employees from right across the business from uh, the power production part of our business, uh, our energy generation uh, plants, for example, uh, regional operations employees uh, that are out and about on our, uh, on our uh, transmission system. Uh, and um, also, uh, folks from our control center operations uh, that work at our control center uh, that are responsible for the dispatch of, of uh, the power system on a daily basis. Uh, the team from our customer care center, our engineering teams, and more teams as well, our enterprise asset management uh, teams, a few people from those teams involved, uh, the staff in a 24 7 basis to prepare for this whole other event and respond to it. What that brings, just uh, very briefly, in terms of uh, you know cold weather, uh, extremely cold weather. Uh, what what we um, really track is load, is system load, and, and by that I mean so as everybody is you know using um, electricity in their homes and their businesses right across the province, 
every time someone is, you know, using an appliance or cooking or whatever it may be, that strong load on the system and the aggregate or all of that, you know, together creates overall system load. Uh, so as we think about that, all of the loads and all of the individual loads summing up to a total load across the entire system on that cold day, uh, we served a record hourly peak load of uh, 2,455 megawatts. That was 217 megawatts higher or 10% higher uh, than the previous all time peak of uh, 2,238 megawatts back in January of 2004. So very cool day, high load on, uh, on the system uh, that day in terms of what we served. We weren't alone in that regard in Nova Scotia, certainly at the maritime region. As I mentioned earlier, certainly that, uh, that cold weather was right across the region. Uh, the maritime region itself also reached a new all-time peak of 6,300 megawatts at that day. And that also exceeded the previous record by about 10%, by about 600 megawatts. And then reaching further into the province of Quebec, the system load also exceeded their previous record peak by about 5%, where they hit uh, a peak of about 42,700 megawatts in the province of uh, Quebec. Uh, also of note, uh, this peak uh, load on that day, that did exceed Nova Scotia Power's uh, current firm planning peak by about 400 megawatts. And by firm planning peak, I'm referring to interruptible customers in the province. So we do have a number of customers across the province uh, that are on an interruptible rate. Uh, and uh, so uh, at times like this, uh, we, we work with those, those customers to um, notify them and uh, interrupt that, that load to be able to continue to serve a uh, firm load on our system. Go to the next slide. Uh, again, I mentioned a few of these things before, but just a few uh, pictures. Uh, with respect to the uh, response company wide, you can see uh, most uh, of our energy delivery team out uh, with our line trucks out of buckets doing uh, some work that day, make sure the equipment is operating reliably. Uh, and uh, the uh, emergency operations center that I uh, mentioned as well, uh, see folks not in the, in the middle of this uh, slide, uh, a few employees from our uh, one of our power plants on the far top right, just making sure the equipment is ready to be maximize for full load and being able to serve that load as I just described earlier. And then just an example on the bottom right of some of the information that the folks in our high control center will be monitoring uh, throughout this event. So lastly, just a few key points to leave everybody with on this cold weather event load. Uh, I mentioned uh, those already in terms of uh, the peak load that, that was served. Um, our generating assets, uh, so at our, at our power plants, uh, they all performed uh, very well. Uh, all of our thermal plants, our hydro generating plants across the province, uh, wind farms as well, and also uh, the, uh, the import resources uh, through the ground circuit and maritime link all performed uh, very well to serve at, at, uh, at uh, record load that day. Um, and uh, again, the system did have sufficient. Uh, generation in, in ports uh, available to serve our firm load uh, throughout the event. Uh, our TD assets, again, uh, all performed very well. Uh, the bulk power transmission system performed well for the most significant events. Uh, our transmission system, um, our distribution feeders, uh, also uh, generally operated within their uh, limits in some cases uh, due to, uh, you know, Restaging some mitigation work that our teams uh, have done prior to the event. I'm sure that they uh, performed for that as well. We did have some local TD equipment uh, we kind of overloaded that day uh, due to the extreme loads resulting from extreme local temperatures uh, I had described earlier, but so with engineering mitigations, interventions, and work that was done, it made it possible to uh, minimize that. In terms of operational response, just again, cross functional team uh, from all parts of uh, the business came together to uh, respond to the spend. Uh, the operations coordination center that I mentioned earlier opened up and uh, just uh, a really uh, strong bringing that together of the resources from across the business to uh, respond. We're going to zoom in now from the place now that you've done it and uh, I'm going to turn things over to you. My colleague is here. I'll go one. My name is Keith Callahan, a senior manager of reliability uh, for execution. And then our goal is to 
prior to data, some of this uh, look for and on the next uh, couple today. Um, following vegetation uh, management, uh, our engineering team that will focus on reliability, uh, investing in our grid to perform our grid and build the standard uh, in increasing standards, our district of equipment. Excuse me, actually, also the um, inspection program. So we do an inspection program of all of our uh, distribution assets uh, on a close a year, or, sorry, for two years. Uh, we look at all of our equipment, try to identify and very quickly and advance the change of or get to work in full day. So um, we'll spend a bit of time on, and I'll say, um, some circuits or features that we're paying attention to and have our eyes on. Uh, in the municipality, uh, two of which are fed on the time of which uh, substation, so 4M, uh, 312, and 313, and those numbers mean uh, nothing to anyone in Russia Day. Uh, for us, uh, it's really a substation number and then a circuit number. The circuit number has some information in for us as far as voltage uh, circuit is. So, a couple um, circuits of time of which, one out of Halliburton and one out of Rajabi that we're uh, monitoring, and I say monitoring because when we watch all of our feeders and performance all of our feeders, but these are ones that have had um, some events or reliability impacts, and uh, we want to make sure that we're paying attention to our cause, understanding uh, the need to put reliability and get it to the right place. So the next slide, please. Again, uh, number 62N is uh, Bridge Avenue, um, and here, which I mean, with 2,400 customers on it, it has some towards Brookfield, uh, Brookfield, Churchville, Woodfield. It's um, the monitors a problem feeder, but really on track right now to all the performance standards this year. So we, we've done some work up there, we feel better about it, and it's it's trending better. Um, and, and that one example, another one of the Halliburton 56 Central 14 uh, is the substation stoker here. That's around 3,100 customers. Extends along North Upper Street and back here Rhode Island. Also covers West Victor as far as West Brands, Bloomingdale, Rhode Island, North Carolina. Um, we did have some areas of the speeder that we had some issues with, specifically around Scottsdale and Scottsdale and Butler Hill, and and really they were the outcomes of, of you know that uh, since we were coming to that we still learned. And then the two feeders out of Hamilton uh, Bridge. Um, it's then from time to push back in Victor County, uh, River Town, Cape John, Broken Hill. Uh, both these feeders are being monitored again as problem, as problem feeders, but uh, both are below the threshold, which would be possible. So, uh, next slide, please. Um, so for the vegetation management, um, since 2015, we uh, spent approximately 16.7 million uh, in the tree maintenance, I'll say, or tree trimming in Pickett County, and, and it worked out to be roughly 570 kilometers of transmission lines and nearly a thousand acres of transmission lines. Uh, it would be a combination of mowing, uh, burial trimming, or ground cutting. Uh, and other transmission right away, support on the distribution circuits, and some of which we just said uh, much more on the screens. Uh, the plan for 2023 would be another 110, 150 kilometers of distribution lines, and we're about halfway through that program for 2023. So uh, that's me really to try to reestablish uh, the right of ways and have that you know, 10 feet on either side of the conductor, or something to be compact. I don't think something's going and even some of that means. So we're well into a program this year with the pathway through. Uh, on the transmission side, uh, we're moving another 170 hectares of vegetation in the railways. We're able to have a good time, so I'm just not going to make sure we're going into it. We identify circuits. Uh, basically, we have our inspection program. For the distribution system plus our vegetation inspections on the charter daily and probably that are really problem circuits in place and make that really much possible. Over to the next slide. Uh, 
And this is the visual. I know it's uh, probably hard to see, and you may try to pick out uh, certain streets in there, but really this was from 2016 to 2022, where we completed uh, pretty significant tree trimming uh, along the distribution surface. So every green dot would be a collection point of, of a span of water that needed to be trimmed and uh, trimmed or mowed or ground cut, depending on how far along the trees were. And all this work would be completed. Uh, Next slide. And this is a bit of a look for 2023. So, uh, in green being complete and red uh, remaining for 2023. So, this would speak to about 110, 115 kilometers of line and 55 yards of water green. So, we can look at the tree work. For uh, 2023, and um, that was what we'll continue for the rest of most of the year. It's been several other problems of training. Um, so, like the column, we have the impact uh, or pain we all had on, on our system and on, on customers. Um, we're happy to say that the frequency of outages uh, during months or weather days uh, in the municipality had not increased, regardless of the impact of the uh, since 2020. So, uh, even though it's 2020, we were seeing increased uh, issues from a liability standpoint, and we're seeing the frequency of outages dropping or staying steady uh, since 2020 in the municipality. Uh, we are seeing more adverse weather, of course. Um, and, and we still uh, start with pre contract, pre contacts that we're working hard to uh, catch up with. So we have had a lot of spiking in the last, uh, last month or two that uh, most people have tested, which is has been rare from what we've seen in the past year. So uh, lightning is a tough one because uh, it can be manual damage or any sense of damage. Uh, so pretty flat outage. Uh, we would have um, all of our substations or urban centers, but most of them have a combination of urban and rural areas. So, um, returning approach often different between urban and rural. We, we trim the trees in urban, uh, not, to, not to affect people's homes, properties. In rural areas, we hope people can mow and really establish it right away. So, there's a little bit of approach there to. Uh, Reliability and specifically those station management uh, urban issues. Well, again, our substations, uh, so we can talk about that and make sure we get like that. And then the coastal circuits, um, obviously, in short folks have seen uh, some of the damage up along the coast and uh, we're still in the process of having some of the same people and customers. So, uh, Honest, and strong gardening, being strong gardening because the system in the lines up there. Um, so, 62 specifically, uh, it has historically been uh, one of the more problematic features in this colony. We have uh, seen improvement over the year, and it was a lot of the features in this colony here in the top 10%. Any interruption being over again to the point where we're going to Questions for the general? Is there any questions left to go? That's all. So, yeah. Just over the past half week. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so, this slide is already talked about trimming along the 114 kilometers of line about halfway into this year. Uh, and we have also just today that answering specific questions around the education with the program. Uh, I mentioned the distribution line inspection program. So, we look at all of our feeders every second year. And try to identify if it needs to be replaced before it fails. Our team is doing that on a daily basis now, really beaming uh, and working on the system to try to get that repair student. And, and really, it's the same theme around the target of putting a fixed amount of equipment. So, stuff we know that one more time it fails, transformers, insulators, uh, switches, we try to collectively replace those. Uh, so, I'll that so just for all those, we did have some slides on the maintenance transition right? You want us to wait for those and answer the question? Yeah, why that's good. Let's do that so that we don't run time short of our questions. Okay. Uh, 
go back to that, otherwise the trade will only be a good thing. Okay. Depending on how many questions there are. First, I would I'd like to thank you for about three years of the presentation. Um, and we're not here to criticize what you're doing. We're here to try and work with you and make sense. And we have other questions for North Coast Power, too, that probably we're not going to have time for tonight. It may have to do with the general state, you know, that is on our agenda later in the evening, and also to do with our SB Internet project. But we may have to forego those for tonight in order to. Uh, the main concern of most counselors is how do we keep this from happening? We can be to the degree that it is, we can't control the weather. But uh, and full credit to all the people that were working and all the people that you've been trying to help. Uh, not, not aiming to criticize anybody for all that hard work, uh, but rather looking at how, how do we make it better for next time. We're hearing, you know, from our residents that we can't go through that. Uh, it's just too much for we have a lot of older folks on the next the countryside and. Uh, Disabled folks and whatnot, so we're looking at all the building lifts, so we're looking at uh, all kinds of things that we can do, maybe council's point of view, but uh, we've always mentioned different kinds of repairs and the green tech and stuff, so I think we need eventually an explanation of just what that means, but uh, I don't want to shorten the time for questions, so I'm going to open up at this point uh, to councillors, uh, there were questions they might have, but uh, they were particularly interested in the only how we. Then that happen. You want me to maybe see some of that or maybe? No, I'm going to let the question sort of dictate how we go at this point. Uh, who would like to go first? Go ahead, Councilor Rodney. Yes, Mr. Chair. Um, some, one of the frustrations that you know, customers experience during is, uh, you know, and I want to say reliability of information they were receiving when they called in to, to get updates. Has this been addressed or can we look forward to an improvement in that service? So I, I can start with that. There's, there's a number, number of things that have been reliable information. Um, so as you know, the telecom systems were down for the first few days. So getting information in the field and uh, being able to uh, put that into our systems was challenging at first. As we get more information, as we get more people in the field, we get better understanding of where the damage is and what the causes are of the images. That information does get from our systems and our call center or resources can consider our information. But the first week, it was difficult to get that information. But that is our goal. Our goal is to get that information as accurate as possible. That way, the customers do call in and get the information that they need. Okay. Uh, I have many, so don't know where to start. First of all, I want to thank you for coming, presenting. As you say, this is an opportunity that I want to solve. Um, the same there was frustration of anger. That's what the power would be looking for. Say your response in a particular kind of world, I kind of think there the politest terms I knew was that it was completely unacceptable. About the 12, 14, 16 weeks that this we didn't even see a, a, an SPI cable. And I only live five miles plus. Um, it was true all over. Now I know the dam. You know, my first question is what was done to triage the damage in days one, two, or three after the hurricane? So I can start with that. Um, the way the uh, power system works is that there are generating stations with transmission lines that transmit the power from the generating stations to the community. The communities that voltage to step down to substations and then distribute it on the themselves. Our first priority is getting that transmission system back up and running. So the first few days focus on getting the transmission system up and running. Those are the lines that run through wooded areas and right of ways, not very visible to the public, but not along the roadsides. So we would have crews working in those areas, putting the power back on, so the substations and communities could be restored. Then the crews work with EMOs, so we have uh, priorities from EMO from hospitals, medical facilities, um, lots of different uh, water facilities, pumping stations. Those are critical uh, areas to focus on there. And then we work into the actual individual feeders that Keith was spoken about among various communities as well. 
Sorry, crews were out the first few days focused on the transmission system, doing all the assessment on there, and then they moved into the distribution system. I will say that I think we did a good job and continue to do a good job with your transmission system. It's a distribution system that's the problem. Well aware of, of that. Uh, I do have several other questions that I may, Mr. Chair. Um, the, uh, the wind speed map to show that may well be accurate, but it's certainly not reflective of the damage that was done by you. Um, it's my understanding that Blaze Bay and in particular the coastal county of the most severely damaged. So we'll come back to my triage question. Do you fly over? Do you do any assessment of this where the worst areas for we do use helicopters. We had about 10 helicopters in the air. Um, they could not fly the first few days after the unit. The winds were still relatively high. It took a few days for those winds to get below a level of where the helicopters could fly. But we had 10 helicopters in the air flying around and doing a, a survey of the transmission. Okay. Um, you know, I mean, many of us who had access to the data from your own map. Was part of each map. We started noticing around May 11 or 12 that there were still several thousand, 6,500 in that range around May 12 in Pictou County. That represented 50% or more of the total outages in the province. So, yeah, we felt we were left to last at day 13, day 14. We were up 75, 80%. Okay. And by that time, of course, there were Dozens and dozens and dozens of crews. Perhaps. People by that time were extremely frustrated. Where are the And why have they not come out to hedge them, top or hip, on top, and, and fix some of these inner problems? Why have we seen no one? And, and that's the real frustration I get from my people to this day. Where the hell were you? It was on the news, so the best I could see it, so we had a generator. Um, you know, we can see that there are groups traveling through Victor County. We certainly appreciate the fact that you have an uh, emergency base, we'll call it, at the Wellness Center, and I believe you had a sub base in uh, Blue Harbor. That area was really good to cover. But the frustration was that in many, many communities, there was just nothing. Just nothing. Or until the very tail end, you look at any of this kind, and they were down to a dozen. I'm not counting, they were down to less than 10. We still had 3,400. How can you explain that? How, how can I explain that to my residents? So, so a few things. Uh, we had hundreds and hundreds of crews. You know, I don't remember who would be, but roughly 1,500 crews. We brought in crews from Ontario, Quebec, all of Atlantic Canada, New England, and we stationed them throughout the entire province at the beginning. And the storm actually hit, and we saw that it split between the CBR bend and the Pickle County and then the guy. We focused our crews in both of those areas. We did set up that staging area at the Pickle uh, Wellness Center. We also had a satellite EOC at our Truro Depot that was focused on putting the efforts in this area. And unfortunately, this was a very hard area. The slide that we had up here to show the winds above 140 kilometers an hour. The most extensive damage was in this area. Because of that, it did take a long time for the crews to make those repairs. I certainly agree that we were extensively damaged. It's the feeling was, because we weren't seeing any crews, zero, not we're hearing with these hundreds and hundreds of crews. You see them rolling through in the Cape Breton. We're in any staying here to fix our communities. The entire communities, entire lines that were, um, I represent the almost entire, entire rural area. Hamilton Road wraps around the town West Point. It's the most suburban area I had. The uh, part of Westville was back on to the day. Uh, down the road area, day 11. You know, people were pretty frustrated. I'm just, just giving you examples. I got uh, a couple of recommendations that I'd like to make. Uh, one is do not use yellow pine poles from the southern United States. In fact, before you buy poles, you should increment them. And, uh, and have a standard on no all other trees that if the growth lines are too wide, you don't buy them because you're not very strong. Buy your poles from 
stands that move very slowly. And had therefore slow growth rates. So that, the poles stand up. That's uh, my sincerely belief. You never like this. That we need to end the monopoly of social power. It would be the best thing for the citizens of Nova Scotia and the long run. Be the best thing of social power. Under sharp impressions, much better. And second recommendation: we need to work on improving the triage. It's very obvious. That the peninsula from King's Head around to the United and all the way up to Caribou Shore got clobbered. We need to get more crews in there sooner, not later, not, not to the very end. Okay. And um, finally, this is also won't be popular, but popular view, but won't be popular with the general landowner. Uh, our trees grow 40, 50, 60, 70 feet tall. It's ludicrous to suggest to put in the Kendra right away as any name for them. Uh, we really need to have the discussion in our society for making those notes go for right ways. Uh, at least half, maybe two thirds of height of those trees. So that when they come down, they cannot geometrically hit. Until we get serious with that, unless Fiona comes, you're going to have a lot of work again. Okay, so those are my three recommendations and the monopoly. Improve your tree edge systems. Improve our residents. Thank you. Thank you. Well, they're responding to that across the next question. One of two. Well, you have something else to do. So, so thank you for the feedback in the polls. Um, we take that very seriously. We are increasing the cost for polls. We are buying tougher polls, wider polls now than we had before. Make sure that we are in the culprit. Check the role for it. Absolutely, for sure. Yeah, so we think we do take that very seriously. Thank you for that feedback. Triage is something we also take very seriously. It's a big part of our storm defending and our storm restoration. What made Fiona difficult is access. In a lot of locations, we couldn't even get in to that triage. We're very closely with the DMO, with the military. The military gave us resources from day one, and they were going in clearing areas so that we could take crews in. So those first few days, we didn't see crews. Military was in there clearing the way so that we can actually get in there and do more triage. But I completely agree that triaging is critical to make sure that we know where we can put our produce to be. So we should go. Okay, and uh, we'll move on to Councillor Roy. Thank you for coming out this evening. Um, I've been in the area as a part of the work in the harbor. I don't have any sort of understanding when we're scaling up into the yard, and there was a lot of frustration. I think you guys understand how hard it oh, is. We appreciate it. So, for that, one, of the, one of the items that stand, stand out for me is I spent a little bit of time for a few days and suddenly the oral, the oral was down there, was a little bit longer. One of the frustrations I that you know is the lack of communication between Nova Scotia Power and I thought it was rainbow because. Um, I know for sure we had two crews that I knew up down in our area. I mean, what was the other to get our down there? They really came to us at the fire off asked it was where we were sending them to do something with the, with the trees and, and that sort of thing. And of course, they couldn't go near the power. They didn't have any, any kind of power that had any power mission to work with them. But they were desperate to do some work and just sitting in our area for hours. And no one was dispatching, no one was sending them anywhere. Is it whether it was about the communication with the power commission or was we all not really sure, but it was definitely a lot of communication. And also, I thought how that started that was that discussion of who thought to work with our commission for planning trees and that sort of thing. And I know they spent on full day sitting in our parking lot. It don't work. So for me, um, I really hope to see a better communication. It, 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 you can't bring them to the other company because we're going to be hit around again. No big hurricane. But hopefully, we won't make all the same mistakes we made to deal with it. We are really working, and I guess that's the question is are you working on good communication? But you're not the people that think have to come together to be staying or get the work done. So, thank you for the feedback on the no need for that times we do have the endorses at the provincial uh, coordination center in Dartmouth, which is a provincial EMO, and they do facilitate with the regional EMOs as well. 
However, there are many of those that we recognize that communication could be better. Uh, we actually, uh, as part of Paul's new team, as director of reliability, we are hiring four reliability advisors across the province. These people will be embedded in communities, working very close to stakeholders, and uh, which everybody who has a best interest in that uh, reliability, which is everybody in this province, like, focusing on those areas where we can communicate better. Uh, so they may be able to help actually work well. We recognize that we need to do that. For the other side of that, a little bit not only with stores, so we obviously have those reliability advisors in place, hired uh, on reliability advisors. Province and on the West Control Province, the Eastern Federal Province, and that's what I'm going to do over at Trim and over at Chicago. And uh, so that will increase the level of the rate of rules. Not the same, be able to provide that, that information, but not only just during sales, but also in this day to day business. And the next day, we're going to show you what else. Thank you guys very much for coming, but uh, I'm just wondering. Uh, when the uh, when we hit the river and they were clearing the, the lines from Chan Charter Road down to the Big Gut Ridge, and we hit, they stopped, and I was very surprised to see that after the, the storm, they were back and they cleared it all the way. Man, they made a good job. It, it, they went, it must have been 20 feet back in and cleared it right down. I mean, it's the best I've ever seen it. I was just wondering. Now it's starting to grow again. I mean, you got Paul, oh, you got things that are going to grow fast. Did you guys look at getting in there with whoever's numbers and try and knock them things down before they get any bigger? And it's going to save you have to come and cut down trees. You're going to just you have it break down to, to the way it was, uh, you know, a year ago, you know? Uh, it's something, that's one question I have. Is there any, any uh, do you look at doing that or not? Yeah, I'll try to take this to the next Ross probably could uh, speak to better. And Ross is the coordinator in this area. So um, we, for us, want to always, if probably possible, get it to the point where you see like that and then maintain that thing right away. Versus every time they send a bucket from the top, trim trees, get them away for a large burst, the cost, the time, the effort go way up with the load. Uh, we're just so much better off, especially rural areas. So that's uh, our program is what we try to stop to right away and then maintain the right ways by the cross numbers. Absolutely. We, we like to get the trees before they're uh, before we can do the fire trucks again for sure. And you might see that we're doing a lot of this latest state in different parts of the uh, county. And as far as you're saying the 20 feet back, we are actually pushing, we're trying to get close to 20 feet, especially where we have species like poplar. Which I don't know if you know this, but there's a vast majority of our allergies were the poplar trees. Uh, so we've been really pushing, uh, working with property to say, look, you know, can we, can we take another 10 feet here, another 15 feet here, to see if we can get some of these trees out of here? That's not it. You know, it's really, I mean, I was hoping to do because I mean, it looks so good that if you keep it up, it would be, be great. But just one other request I have to ask you, and so go off to. You know, if you don't know, but when the plant goes to close at 30 or whatever, are you looking at close to the complete before you go to turn it over to something else, like Dr. C or something, and just be moving around? You know what's going on there? I can, I can see for that. And uh, being on the key slides on that, I can offer uh, just a uh, slide to you on that specific topic and ask your question if you'd like. It is on your agenda for later tonight, so perhaps we better. Uh, Rather than have for you guys a letter, we're right here. So there is a lot of concern. It's come from World 7. They always came out of the Angus book. They read when the word Duncan C was meant for that. There is a lot of rye barrels. And uh, I think maybe there's some expectation for natural gas. That they could come from Duncan C. So uh, if you want to speak through that, just keep it as brief as you can so that we can get more questions and have a list here. Certainly, I can, I can speak with my colleagues who are here and some yeah. slides. Go ahead, then. Okay. Sure. okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so this slide that we have in front of us is just uh, a bit of an overview of the intention generating station. Uh, I was speaking to Vern Asti earlier in terms of serving Vern load on our system. And so the generating station here in Benton provides that Vern uh, capacity to the grid today. 
Uh, it's an important source of thermal uh, masking base load energy on, on the system, as well as backing up variable generation uh, on the system, uh, most notably wind, but wind is blowing. Having generators to be able to uh, drive the uh, reserved load is, uh, is critical. Uh, the station today uh, currently provides approximately 10% of that uh, current generating uh, capacity on the province, and uh, it, is, it is required uh, to meet those uh, system requirements today. Um, on the bottom half of the slide, there's just uh, some information about, uh, about both units, currently five and six, and we have time. Uh, I'll uh, maybe leave that for a question to go to the next slide. That's okay. That'll help with this uh, question. So on this slide, uh, just a little bit of background um, with respect to uh, the integrated resource planning that's ongoing at the IRP. And so um, also as uh, relates to all of this is uh, the federal and provincial legislation for the fire generation uh, to be based out by 2030. And so uh, we are uh, working uh, within that current uh, legislation to do so. Uh, so we have modeled the impact of meeting that requirement through uh, the integrated resource plan for uh, the IRP work, and that process is used to create a directional, long-term efficiency strategy for uh, social power. So cool. uh, we did. Uh, we have presented one of the most likely scenarios, or many different scenarios, that have been modeled within the integrated resource plan. We did present one of the most likely scenarios from the IRP in our 2023 10-year system report. It was uh, recently filed with the Special Utility Review Board. Uh, that report is reported as updated annually. Uh, it, can, it can change in uh, response uh, from year to year in terms of um, you know various uh, changes from the planning perspective and changes in the uh, planning environment. Um, What's showing in that for trend movement five, and it is outlined in that latest uh, 10 year system outlook, uh, is that trend five was forecast uh, to be phased out in, 2000, uh, in uh, 2027 or 2028. Um, and that is at a time when what we forecast at this stage is alternative sources of firm capacity are added to the system in order for us to be able to retire trend five. Uh, that replacement capacity is anticipated to include fast acting generation uh, in the form of combustion turbines uh, and grid scale batteries. So, that fast acting generation loads, those uh, combustion uh, turbines can then be fueled by natural gas, they can be fueled by light. For train unit six, uh, it is forecast to be phased out in uh, the recent 10 year system on the report in 58. Again, that is one additional fast acting generation that will replace that firm capacity that I was speaking to earlier. And it also uh, grid uh, reliability services at that unit. Provides. So, further out into the uh, planning and obviously uh, to meet requirements by, by 2030. In terms of what some of the potential future options could be, um, the Trenton site is viewed favorably uh, for future fast acting generation. Uh, in addition to that, fast scientific generation is uh, viewed as a potential site for renewable integration and with support customers. Uh, we are working really closely with our employees uh, to evaluate those opportunities uh, for transition to new technologies uh, that will be added to the system um, to replace our uh, traditional field park generation plan today. And then lastly, those uh, decommissioning efforts. Uh, we take place to provide significant job opportunities for employees to transition to the future. That is the beauty of the matter this stage. Uh, for, yeah. <laughs> Thank you uh, for that uh, follow on the, uh, you said on the, uh, on the attend the uh, climate change advisory committee of this council and the uh, council of the world of peers that uh, and and when it came up at our last meeting, it was unanimously a no for sure. I think we didn't hear that uh, to everyone on the scene. Uh, we we, we turned the page, I think, on that. I think, we, yes, we have to have that firm. I know we can be with the of the on sun this time, uh, but we also have, have to, we, we know these storm periods are being mostly caused by climate change. 
can't continue to put stuff in the air that we know is up to deposit. So the rules for coal were put in by the province and the bids for a reason, uh, not to be replaced by something maybe, but something just almost as bad in the atmosphere. So I, I don't think there's any uh, room for that in the sky. It's good to hear that they're going to be closed before 2030, uh, or closed for coal, I should say, but we, we don't necessarily want to close. We, we need the jobs for those employees and whatnot, and we need that firm power to be here. But uh, not, not in the current form, so it could be almost as bad as this Do you want to follow up the uh, council as well? Yeah, no, is it just you know, in, it's it's you know, we've been all hoping that uh, you know, this is going to be the end of the poly ash and, and, and the problem with the uh, transgenerate station. But it's the more the sense of it, we could be getting into a, a worse situation in, in some aspects of it. So, really hope you think on that. And, and uh, because it's uh, Lee Trenton, <laughs> we put up with enough. I mean, we, we've been we hit on it so hard, it should have never been put into the, the town anyway. You know what I mean? They never do that again today. So, uh, I hope you really could be considering just close it or, or, or the, the substation there with something. But, Nothing with the, uh, you know, that's uh, up to see or, or anything like that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Morton. Uh, thank you for coming here this evening. Appreciate you coming. Um, I'm going to kind of echo what Councillor Parker and Councillor Warren said. I too was, I represent District 3, which is all oh, along. Well, we I was still kind of had the tenant picked us. So, right on the Northumberland Shore, right up Bayview, through Caribou, with Caribou Island, et cetera. And as you know, we got extremely hard hit. It's still quite a mess to drive by and the forest and vegetation out there. Um, I got many phone calls of frustration. I think people were very upset. I know myself, I was. 13 days of their power. I don't, I live on the main drag. Um, I'm not in some flying spotted road somewhere. So, you know, it was, it was frustrating in that sense. And, you know, I don't think we saw those first power truck. I think the first, um, first power truck we saw was one from New Hampshire. Um, I think that the frustration lies is that this, with communication, I think people, Spend a lot of money, get a lot of money from the social power every year. Where's the value for the money if they're not getting services that they um, need and deserve? And by that, I mean preparation. Going back to vegetation management, um, we've had a problem with vegetation management this county for a while. And I think a lot of our power issues in the past have been caused by that. And I think that our lines haven't been well maintained. If we look over a 20, 20 year period, we made a while. I think it was something that just kind of wasn't done for a while, in my opinion. I um, might stats or data that proves that wrong, but I think looking around, um, that would be my opinion. So I'm asking, um, I guess, when did the push start to really get into it to really tackle this vegetation management? And with all this data that you provided us tonight in this presentation, there needs to be some outcomes. So what new protocols are you doing, establishing with um, uh, vegetation management um, that you're doing now as um, as compared to um, BQ? We don't start with that. So definitely yeah, appreciate the feedback. I think a lot of the communication is a big part of uh, this, but also a little input in our liability as a whole. So uh, all of the mentioned in this presentation was so they are investing more in our viability this year and for the next five years. So previous years, previous five years, we invested 20 to 25 million in vegetation management across the province. 2023, we're investing 32 million in vegetation management. Then starting next year, we'll be spending 45 million in the three years. So we know that vegetation management tree trimming is uh, the number one cause of this, and we need to do more than Unfortunately, we don't need any of the trees in the province. We have to permission for every tree that we cut or trim. Whatever the money that we are spending on it, we know that uh, it's going to be a liability. Okay. 
to answer your question around when we really started to dive into vegetation management, we always done that. I think a, a turning point for us was after Hurricane Juan. Hurricane Juan was the first major hurricane that we had to get in high cover car system. Ever since then, we've been studying about vegetation management. This year, we're spending 32, and next year, we'll be studying. Respectfully, you can throw money at a problem or it doesn't necessarily always fix the problem. I think, I guess what I'm asking you, what changes have you made since, I mean, you must have learned something from Fiona that, you know, maybe wasn't working beforehand. There's some changes in the government call that you're making now. Is there any changes to that? Yeah, absolutely. Yes, ma'am. I should. Sure, maybe I'll get to that sort of view. So certainly one of the things that has changed even recently so I have to mention the cloud work on, but in the last few years, what we noticed is that the intensity of the weather, the frequency of being storms has of course. And so the investment that I had mentioned is aligned with that as well as responding in the face of climate change and you know, the, the issues and challenges uh, in more recent years getting worse uh, than they were in you know, prior decades. So, so that speaks to you know, one of the drivers through that increase in uh, still not about vegetation management, but certainly things that we would look at uh, in terms of practices and uh, protocols. Uh, we we do look at uh, the use of technology, for example, the ways that uh, you know, we can use innovative technologies to enhance our existing vegetation management programs. Uh, you know, it's sort of potential for us to uh, make use of cellular imagery, for example. That is something that we're looking at right now. That's newer technology that's not widely adopted in the industry. Uh, you know, today, but we do look at those things and, uh, you know, if there's value to them and then I think it will bring value to, to customers, uh, then employing those solutions that make sense. So, so I guess the short is, yes, we, we are looking at things like that and that would be one of the central uh, you know, innovative technologies that we're exploring uh, so that we can respond further in the face of uh, the future. Just, uh, can you talk about the technology and trying to do things different? Uh, Increased investment is going to also allow us to bring in more contractors, uh, more contractors, so featuring contractors, and uh, more access to tree covers and storm events as well. Because uh, it's a struggle sometimes when most of the to see more gets into an event, everybody trying to get the same for resources. So, so the increased investment, we're also going to add the supporting uh, resources to help the program run smoother, make sure we have great number of losses and uh, students in the field. I love that technology to identify what needs to be cut up and you then use uh post coordinated to folks that don't know really and it's a complex and really that's the game that I thought. So really trying to go for a couple of different spots and other technology to be built and at the approach to this. So I just wanted one thing to add that. So in addition to vegetation management, we are spending more on our assets themselves, so there's a storm current in the floor. Few things we've been storing our system is install a higher class of pole, the poles that are wider and taller. We install insulators that can withstand the weight of trees falling onto the power lines. We're also working in areas where trees, uh, or sorry, where power lines are within trees and wooded areas, moving them out to the roadside, hidden in the woods and trees. So, in addition to vegetation management, we're also investing in against more energetical assets itself. Okay, thank you. Um, if I would I mean, ask a few, just a, a few more short questions, please, let us know this morning. Um, I've heard from many residents time and time again that maybe uh, wires on poles is the best way to get power to the poles in Nova Scotia that maybe it's a thing to look at, but we bury them or another solution. Have you looked at that and what do you say to those homeowners that are maybe saying questionable solutions? I would say it's it's a balance of things. So there are 500,000 poles throughout the province, 32,000 kilometers. It's a lot of infrastructure that today is above ground. So while it's cost prohibitive to put it all underground quickly, there are things that we can do to get some lines underground. So when new subdivisions are being built, new houses are being built, line running from the pole to the house can be put underground, the actual subdivision itself can be put underground. We work with developers and landowners on that to do that. We're also looking at microgrid technology, so technology that would allow communities to be um, fed by solar or wind power just for the communities themselves. We're trialing those in the Amherst area now. There are things that uh, we are looking at 
that are different than just the traditional overhead lines that uh, run from the substation. You know, that was a big, a big question that I get asked if, if there was any, like, I was talking earlier about, about, about changes that there was going to be something on the horizon, anything coming up that Fiona has kind of made you differently. So, yeah, no, and I, and I really appreciate you coming tonight. And we've waited a long time to speak with this council. This is something that we, I think, have talked about right after the hurricane was getting a sexual view. I'll, I'll speak for myself on this. I know, and, and others that I've, residents that have spoken to me is that Victor County really did feel good. And we, I um, don't have a TV to that goes like a satellite dish or a cable and like that. Um, so I do get to watch the quote unquote news every night, even though I was one of the fortunate ones with um, a generator. But, you know, it just seemed that everybody was headed to Cape Breton and nobody was headed anywhere up here. As Councillor Carter said, you know, two weeks later, we still have the majority uh, by far. Averages. And I think that Fiona you know, was very hard. I know I can speak for myself and my family and, and, and others. It forever changed our lives that day. It was a very scary, very scary time. Um, but I think that I just I hope that you no know, switch power has, has learned something from this. And I hope that you know what when this does happen again, that um be some changes in in, 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 in in looking at uh i guess preparation and also i guess um uh, distribution during the storm so so that we don't uh, get the frustrations i guess next time so thank you for that feedback we, we do take that very seriously and i apologize for uh feeling that you have it forgotten um we know that communication is a big part of this and we're definitely doubling down on communication Part of that was the way that the ES spun the, the events of Prime Minister went to Cape Breton, therefore they made it seem like the Cape Breton storm at the beginning. That's why we opened the our satellite ESC in Toronto. That's why we used the Wellness Center to say that there was meeting that there was a significant, uh, significant storm in Pico County and that's where all the damage was. So we did for our enemies here, but we also tried to do some different. So, um, I guess it was going just back to the comment of you see it. So yeah, appreciate it. So well, thank you so much. I appreciate you answering my questions this evening. Thank you. And that's it, Councilor Thank you, Mr. Warren. And thank you to the people for coming. I'm glad you came a year later, not to break the time in the fish. And it wouldn't be as easy as far from it. Okay? Because it wasn't a farm and far from it in my area. My area, the same as Councilor Carter's. Councillor Waters, we got hit better. And when you're talking 12, 13, 14 days, and up to 16 in some places. And I thought things would likely have been a lot better because in Elgin, Lorne, when Gary Saturday they, they they've cleared under all the lines in the last few years, and they did a terrific job. And that's Phoenix. That's the outfit that was there. They had big crews in there, and they did a terrific job. But now, a year and a half later, a year later, every tree that they cut down, there's 10 suckers come up around that tree. And they're this high, this high, four feet high. And I know what it's a battle between what you got to run something in there and what you got to big mulchers for spray. There must be a kind of spray sound that somebody's invented by now. But you got spray, but stop this little. Years ago, they went with the tree farmers and they came so. And they didn't went under all those lines. Okay, and it took over three years. But then it was uh, the bad fever of the spray. So, where's the balance there of what it's costing? Like, the railroad was doing sprays, and that's it. But if, if you're spraying with a machine that's this old, Okay, that's a lot different than going around spraying the top of the trees of the road or something. That's no, it's got to be that when it's low. And I know you like to spray in some places. I, I have complaints in my community about the spray in this year, right under it. It's down the road, and I couldn't understand. Here we were, with no power for 30 days, and if we're going to spray under one box or one uh, transformer, some transformers to keep power on. 
But anyway, there's going to be a balance come there, and I'm sure in this world somebody has invented something even it instead of costing ten dollars for a five gallon can, but if it costs thirty, you're still going to be farther ahead if you get the right stuff that's safe for people. They're not most of them salt anyway, but real salt on or something. But in my area, just like Parker's so Parker's Council, it was terrible. It was terrible. And but the best part in our areas, people had neighbors that would go and help their other neighbors. That's the biggest thing that showed up in this disaster. People had the generator, they went to their neighbors. There was, a, there was people scared that they thought they were going to die, right? And if it wasn't for their neighbors coming and helping them, we would have had a really just imagine that that ended in January. The mess we would have and the people and the fires out of this burning down and things get out of control. We were just so fortunate those the time. But anyway, and the other part was the same as what I heard here before. There was crew sitting in that parking lot three quarters of the day or all day because of no dispatcher told them it was. Okay. And you can say, oh, I don't think so, but I know so because I sat there and listened to the people talking, right? Like, this is big county, we know what's going on. <laughs> but these people in the states, like, they were terrific, smart, good people from Vermont, New Hampshire, and nice people, out, and they did one by the work. And when they went to a job, they physically imagined them trucks with the job. Or so maybe some of our thoughts, okay? But I think we have. Few more people get to come and all those of us where the dispatches are only people. So you go to Hamilton Road, you go to Elgin, you go to I'm not through the river road. They knew for those a lot of people did you're getting dispatched out of the city or you know where it, it's it okay and all I can do is hope that the next time things are better and thank you Take them up. There we go. Okay. I know you make big money, so you that's what's big money. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, let's talk about the spring. Well, I know it's because it's dead. Yeah, sure. We all jump in with the rest of the day. Yeah, yeah. 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 All of the herbicides that we use, of course, are approved by Health Canada. We use it very selectively. Uh, and uh, there are times where it's an appropriate method uh, to use, uh, but, but certainly we minimize the use of, uh, of herbicide spray. And um, you know, when we can get into you know, areas and access, and uh, certainly it's, it's, it's very important that uh, you know, we meet all of the requirements that we need to meet to safely use uh, any kind of herbicide spray. And so we Loaded, um, and uh, you know, there's times when it does, it does make sense that it says uh, any approach to hit, uh, but it is very stuck in the small, small spread of the So the areas that we start to uh, grow back up, uh, it makes sense to go back and have a look at those areas again based on what Pete was saying earlier in terms of you know, bringing those back, back down to the ground level before that vegetation then grows up to the need. I don't know if you across the results, you also have that. It's quite important to get the program. A lot of things to us have gone along and said the tribal leaves species have not yet on the all the great shrubs. So we try to hurry for us while along with some of our uh, riverside programs. But there is a lot of backlogs in the riversides. Uh, it seemed in my area the most of anything that got destroyed was a kind of problem. All this thing off, oh, they just grow the whole night and start out taking them. Yeah. So, and we're trying to chase those down as much as we can. So, we're doing it right away now. We see some popular websites. We said, you know, we're talking to farm dealers. Can we get those because they're, they're future problems for sure? And then, you know, there, there are organic sprays that have been, you know, to go with some of the end species, but it's probably our yours as well. What we use the rather greenhouse last year is a very strong concentrated vinegar. See, that's that will kill. Oh, 
kill the shrubs forever, but we'll have to bean back for a year and get something put on each year. But it would be more acceptable to take something yellow from around home. Uh, it gets for a while there and spraying the uh, budworm, and you can have water in the spring, and then you can still be in the uh, So that, uh, that attitude hasn't changed a lot, but I think if we looked at uh, something you know, that people have in their homes that would also act as a herbicide, uh, they might be uh, more acceptable. Okay, I have Councilor Turner next. Thank you, Mr. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you for walking us through the autopsy of the field. Uh, a lot of questions about that. Well, I answered my questions are preparing to be for the track There's a couple of things that uh, the viewers really struck as people in this, uh, in terms of sort of the, the, the alternative sources of Burning capacity, uh, batteries. Tell me what what role batteries can play in mitigating some of the problems that you have going forward. So, where's where's battery power fit into your whole business structure? For identifying the path, and, um, essentially, um, if you think of the the transition to 2030 and then 80 percent of the energy from certified renewable sources. A lot of uh, the um, renewable energy will be from which is energy. So it's, it's you know, the wind is 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 blowing that can generate, or those those uh, wind turbines across the province are generating increasing amounts of wind as well. Not so having sources of energy that can back that up is important to be able to balance the system and that we be able to serve both as sort of wireless batteries is one piece of that. Is the technology there to store large amounts of power? Yes, it is. And it's too expensive. So that, that technology is uh, is well developed uh, today. It's uh, say becoming more adopted across North America. So what we would be looking at today as part of the scenario that I mentioned earlier in the big dispersion plan is up to 100 megawatts of, uh, of grid scale battery storage. So 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 yes, large starting to scale, grid scale battery capacity is uh is that's the integrated system compliance for we so that's integrated in, into the system. Uh, and I guess it can serve as as as, as backup of certain level grid answers up later on. It would move fast at uh, generation. Some details on that. Sure. So, so fast acting generation in terms of what it what it does and why it's important to the system is for the same reasons that I've just described with grid scale batteries being a backup source. Wind is is there. It's those generation. And so um, that, that is one uh, function of fast acting generation. And it's fast acting because it can ramp up very quickly. And so uh, what we uh, see is that wind can you know, drop off. So uh, we forecast what, what wind uh, will be the next uh, day, the next few days, and you know, every hour through the day. And as that wind drops off, there may be a need to bring on generation very quickly if the, if, if the wind drops off very quickly. So fast acting generation, as the name suggests, it acts very quickly and can on very quickly. Uh, and so those would be you know, question turbines, for example, we have some fast acting. Uh, generation on our system today. They are you know, uh, jet engine generators. Are they driven uh, by natural gas? They are driven by diesel. Yeah, our combustion turbines today are driven by diesel, but we do have some that are fired by natural gas uh, as well. Um, so, so but where are they? Uh, so we have uh, fast acting um, combustion turbines at uh, Victoria Junction, uh, at uh, Tuskegee, uh, Burnside, uh, in Maryland. And uh, we also have some motion turbines that are still with the energy station. I said one quick question with your transmission. Lines. Dion had a, had a regular meeting with the residents and some of the concerned citizens around the paper packing regarding discussion power. One of the things that came up a lot in the transmission lines what's the age, what's the average age of the transmission? 
Are they well past their prime? And I, I, I've seen lots of patients where transmission uh, is something that can be really improved upon. There's a lot of resistance to what I understand in transmission models. That could be less of the new technologies. There's no social power exploring that kind of stuff. So to answer your first question, the transmission system in the block of is built in the 70s. But uh, we can do investment in a regular basis. So it's it's really all those wires just like the distribution system. And in that in some cases the skill structures as well. So we have an asset management program the age and the life span of those uh, assets, the quality of the, the health of the assets, and we will invest in them if they start to deteriorate over time. So while the volume was built in the 70s, we invest in it on an annual basis. In terms of new technology, we're looking at new technologies all the time, different insulators, different structures, different wires that we uh, as well. And uh, our transmission system is uh, is relatively reliable. Of, uh, of the two systems, the transmission system and the distribution system, Transmission system ends up being more viable because it's further away from trees. It's a very isolated technology. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for coming out. Um, I learned a lot today. Yes, my, the area that I represent is the southeastern section of Pictou County. It's Plymouth, out uh, to Sunny Bray, Blue Mountain, Bear Feet, and Eastern St. Mary. So, Order of their land mass. Um, some of my areas were up for about 18 days. So, this to counts with the worst one. We're likely to lose all of them. So, we will be talking about deaths. I'm going to talk about that. There's a lot of people who just weren't prepared to stay in that long. And the, the frustration in my district may have been directed towards you, but it was. Just frustration with the situation. I don't think it was. I think you were in the same boat as everybody else. Nobody, nobody would have thought this could ever happen. This is catastrophic. And not oh, this whole end of the problems. Um, but I guess uh, I, I know there's a lot of people dusted off their power saws during the storm, and I heard a lot of injuries on private land, like from landowners that. My age or older with power saw that aren't used to operating power saw. Can you give me any sense of was there many workplace injuries? Like, because you were dealing with just a lot, it was just a devastation of all went over. So, can you ex explain if it was an injury free? Was there, were, were there injuries? We had a lot of crews in here from everywhere. So, just to get a sense, and I, I want to thank all the line and all the crews who were out there in the middle of all this, because so, it was an awful mess. Yeah, so uh, thank you for those words. Um, obviously, we take safety very seriously in most special power, and especially the running events like Hurricane uh, Dorian, Fiona. Uh, there are a lot of people on the ground, and it's very uh, critical for us that we stay safe. So we are really happy to say that there were no serious injuries, zero serious injuries during Fiona, and all those people that were working. There were some high potential severe misses that uh, we avoided, and we documented those, and we made that corrective action for one of those, but nobody was seriously hurt. Thank you. Okay, so we're coming to the end of my list there, and uh, I really don't want to go around again because we're in the 730. Okay, Wayne did not have his turn, but I want to come to the front. Okay, it's good, limited because we're at 730 now. Yeah. We have to move into our regular I'll go very quickly. My district was saying is everybody else is running the communication is key to uh, people that were in the house that were 14 plus, 14 days plus hours. I would love to get the power bill now, but it cost me $802 and gas for 14 days. So when you get the power bill, that's a lot less of that. It makes it happen. But just uh, a thing we have to have meeting again on the internet project. Uh, make ready so you're not coming near as fast as you should be. I think there's some other problems that we may have with the uh, transportation getting uh, permits, maybe. And I think maybe that's the Lord and I that we could have a meeting with him. Block data is on here. Yeah, we, we've had a few meetings on that. I think mean, we have been committed to additional crews to all draw in, but we understand that it's complicated and uh, we are committed. Okay. That's what David Parker was out there. 
I'm going to let Randy go first. Sure. Yeah, I'm going to say a few words to thank you for coming tonight. Uh, I was on the no power for seven days. My uh, friend on the for 14 days. I, I represent a suburb in the area. Nothing's responsible to us. My area, anyway. I only had one call from one resident that whole time, and it was just about to uh, uh, try and get a hold of somebody because they're out of the place of that, out of the power of the more communications. My area wasn't hit as hard as the coastal areas, uh, but there was a place in my area where it was like a tunnel, but the wind came in, it came circling around, came back up, took strips of help. Come down here, took some big trees down, and, and those trees that I took down took down power poles. But those power poles weren't on most of those power's land. You would never take down those trees or hear the wall and anchor the power poles. A great thing, nice looking ornamental trees and things like that. So I think a lot of the damage was caused by trees that were on the product, probably. But what I've seen in and I'm glad to hear that you're looking at going to property owners to say, no, I have to cut down those trees with them. That's on this. But in that, this one, it was this one we've never seen before, and I don't, don't see it for a long time again. But uh, the rules I thought, and the response, and I know about the law center, and there's a lot of things that people say about the world of work, and, and there might be communication problems there. I, I don't know, but I know some of them are out meeting still, right? So some of them are resting and things like that. But, uh, and the crews from all over, and that was something that was never seen here, right? So, which was great uh, forward thinking and things like that to have much going and things like that. So. And the crooks again they did a tremendous job. I thought did what they could. There's a ton of trees that were down, and those things they take time. When you're in an area with all these trees, Chris rocks all over the place, it's not a half an hour job, it's it stays for it, right? So it's like any natural disaster, there's always you can learn from. So, and communications probably is, is one of them can come out of this range. Right? As far as, you know, okay, the problems, it, it's, it's a big problem. There's a lot of people up there. So it is north, northern shore and the north, or the uh, Cape Britain, uh, western part of the eastern shore and that. So there's a lot of people without power. So you, you want to get the right people off. There's a mass amount of people without power there. So I, I know that. That, that's the only natural thing to do is. Uh, with, with all of this stuff, the improvements that you possible, governments and a lot of uh, fossil fuels and things like that, and all the coal, it, it's still cost to our residents going on for, for, the, for your service because, because wind's more expensive. So it's probably more expensive. And, and if you use natural gas, it's going to be more expensive than coal. So. And with all the other uh, things that you plan to do, increase your cost for vegetation and things like that, it's going to cost. But, you know, that's part of the new business. So, again, I'd just like to say thank you very much. And appreciate everything that the groups have done. Thank you. Uh, when I call for an end of the month, I'm absolutely serious. But I want to say that for recognition. But other was just uh, using our web distribution lines. That's okay, but I get that. The other uh, thing I want to say is that I've uh, taken the opportunity several times in 110. The uh, smart air stop with the Halifax proposal with me a couple times later. Um, every council should attend that. And, and now we're going to send a couple of uh, 
better high school students. It's, it's one from it's sponsored by either SPI or here or both. Um, it's just you know you just serve kudos for that. Uh, just for comparison, that's a equal comparison. But we are doing something like that. Thank you. Okay. Um I to go ahead and answer your question. No, I was just going to say thank you. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll just make a couple of quick comments here. I think you've heard a good reflection. My uh, last job was on this. I think questions. I think the board of are here, but you were here. Uh, and I think the uh, council here was right that maybe it was a good thing you weren't here in the three or four weeks after this, after the, you know, it would have been a little less calm, a little more. And voices, I guess. But uh, we really do want. Not, not to have to go through this again. There are people not to have to go through this again. So we would, the effort today, I think, is to get the message out of the clear that we have to make those improvements. Uh, they're very interested in hard to agree. I know we need bigger poles and higher poles. It'd be nice, uh, like Daryl said, to have them all on the ground and everything, but that's not practical in it right now. But it is something we can work slowly at. But, uh, I just want to add to what the deputy warden said. Uh, we're really frustrated. Now, Ben Chow was trying to get her high speed internet system in and, and to get the permits that we need. Every time we meet with people, it seems to improve for a while, and that goes backwards. So, we're into some of that backwards trend now. That's what the Wayne was referring to that we need to have another meeting soon. Uh, I'll just give one example of an area in a very small loop road that had no service in terms of internet that was off from a loop. Um, it was all permanent and everything. You know, where did you go with when the folks went in to do the work? Uh, all the trees had been taken down, homes had been replaced. Uh, the, that homes are crew up, it holds some people up to get their service. So we need to have more discussions on that. And it was brought up by last week by our advisors that a one touch system is called uh, where we can do some of that work for you folks. Uh, we don't need to be held up because you folks don't have enough crews or enough people. I know supposedly we move more in, but uh, you are moving more in. But this seems to be working in other parts of the country and uh, it's not understood why no social power uh, doesn't seem to want to move in that direction. That's a topic for another night. I don't want to get off on track on that uh, because we've had the discussion we want for tonight. I just want to thank you, uh, everybody that was in the background, that was at the front table uh, for coming tonight. Uh, it's just good to have this discussion. So you hear what we're hearing, and we can now say to our residents that yes, no, the fire came and met with us. And we brought up all the concerns or as many as people had on the line that night. It doesn't mean there won't be more for sure. But the, the key in all of this has to be that we know there's more coming and, and we want to be more ready than we were last time. And I, I think that's the house that nobody knew this uh, be this bad or when they predicted the storm. So we're not going to know for the next one either. The more things we can do with you fellas or on our own. Uh, uh, among the building, there's a lot more things we can do too to help people be ready. It, it will come again, uh, and the only common sense thing to do is try to get ready. We, we want to work with you folks, whether it's on our high speed internet or whether it's on uh, getting ready for the next storm. We're not here just to blast you. We're, we're here to work with you. Thank you for coming. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So um, we take our commitment to the rural internet program very seriously. Any kind of we need, we'll definitely do that again. We'll get that other ways to work. And then uh, just to wrap up, so um, the presentation really focused on storms and severe storms like being that in the rain. Why we are investing more money this year and the next five years. Very confident that that is going to improve things. We understand that um, we'll still be storms, we'll still be impacts. So that communication piece is really important as well. Really open to working with people in that regard. So it took us a year to get here. We'll never come back again soon. We have reliability advisor for the area that will be adding that very shortly. We wait to choose that person. Certainly open communicating. Just a debate that we have been working on for quite We'll be very open to apply the project and handle those. So we can definitely put away with it. Sure.
Thanks again for coming and just remember to Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, let's go on and move to the next quarter date and uh, well, that was the court in the next year. Let's take full advantage of the avenue here to make sure everybody's special connection. So, we have correspondence. We have uh, two thank yous from uh, two of our schools, our London region and regional, and then the regional for uh, our verses. Nice to hear from them. And we also have a letter from the Minister of the Environment, the Coastal Protection Act. So, that was circulated and it's been on the news a lot. Uh, certainly, it's come up at our climate change advisory uh, group on different occasions. Uh, for some reason, I don't understand, but uh, the provincial government has decided not to move this legislation ahead, even though it was approved by all three parishes back in the late 2019. But there will be no uh, regulations, uh, certainly not in the foreseeable future. Uh, they're going to study it, uh, let me study it to death. But, um, Common sense, it appears. You know, why would anybody want to put a Windsor cottage here to, too close to the water? I'm um, just the type of thing we heard here tonight from the storms. But uh, one possibility, and I'm not suggesting we can get into it tonight, that the two counties, I uh, believe it was mentioned in the middle of the letter, uh, have moved ahead with their own Coastal Protection Act. But that will probably come up uh, in our planning exercise that we're going through. Uh, you know, as to uh, that that aspect of it, uh, maybe look at uh, you know as we do our planning or the team that's with us does that. Does anybody have any comments to make on the letter we received from this? Go ahead, uh, Councillor What? Just what you brought up there, the you know, it is always the Queens and the Room Group that have their own big plans. We really should look at that at this mayor and that's doing that move forward with it. Because there's nothing to indicate when uh, it's just going to move forward. There's also an act in, in, in this serious moment. Those are very serious moments. I think it's something we have to take very serious and something. And I, I personally don't have any doubt that this letter is meant to steer it toward the municipal and away from the provincial. It's too much heat, I think. And uh, so they're more or less saying, you know, the rest of you should move over to the gentlemen, which we probably will. Uh, but uh, it's disappointing that we actually have an act and get any regulations of any key things. Okay, if there's no more comment on the uh, on the correspondence, we'll move right along to the resolutions. And first, Councilor Turner with municipal service. Yeah. Supporter. You've resolved the resolution, you've resolved the Council of Municipality, the County of Pickle, on the following resolution of civil service channels. Six. Law Church Committee 2000 dollars for maintenance. Salem Presbyterian Church Hall six thousand dollars for new ramp or hall. Western Fire Department eight thousand dollars for system generator purchase. West River uh, Presbyterian Church three thousand four hundred and sixty six dollars for maintenance. For a total of nineteen thousand four hundred and sixty six dollars and cents. Skip 11, Blue Mountain Fire Department, $3,563 for contributions to the generator project. project. East River, uh, St. Mary's Fire Department, $3,500 for contributions to the generator project. Garden the Beating Community Center, $4,000 operating costs also for the generator product project. Greensbrook Cemetery, $400 operating costs. Paul, $1,750 on the cost. East River Valley Fire Department, $1,500 for equipment purchase. East River Valley Community Development Association, $1,500 in these other expenses. 
East River Valley Recreation Association, $2,000 operating costs. Glenbrook Community Hall, $950 operating costs. Plymouth Community and Recreation Association, $3,000 landscape cost. Plymouth Fire Department, Lady Auxiliary, Lady uh, Auxiliary, $950 equipment purchase. Springfield Cemetery, uh, $400 for cemetery maintenance. Trustees of Springville Presbyterian Church, $2,000 contribution to the generated project, total of $25,500. Well, on the hall, six thousand dollars operating costs. Friends by the Park, two thousand dollars operating costs. Hope Rutherford Presbyterian Church, seven hundred fifty dollars more than more than upkeep. Plain Cemetery, one thousand dollars maintenance cost. Marshdale Cemetery, one thousand dollars maintenance cost. Hope for 4H, one thousand seven hundred fifty dollars for each expense and kiosk maintenance. East River Valley Community Development Association, $6,000. Reverting Hall Operations, this letter. East River Valley Recreation, $2,000. Recreation Program Costs, for a total of $20,500. Victor, Nova Scotia, on its eighth day of August 2023, signed by myself, Terry Turner, second by Council. Thank you very much. Any questions on the resolution? Questions? Hearing none, say aye. Aye. Resolution council upon it. I appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Resolution resolved by this council for Ms. Allen County Beckett to resolution for recreation grants. Fifth County Travel Speech, $350 for startup. Fifth County Arts Society, $350 for startup grant for a total of $700. Union Presbyterian Church Youth Group, $1,500 for operating of the grant. This month, Plymouth, Bird John, and Portland Summer Recreation Programs, $750 for a total of $3,000 for operating grants, for a total of $4,500. Aid and Victor, Nova Scotia, State Aid, August 2023, on South Chancellor Brandon Palmer, set by Deputy Board Jane. Second. Is there the reading of the uh, resolution to do with recreation grants? Uh, then moved and seconded. Are there any questions or concerns on that resolution? Okay. Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Carried. Okay, now we'll move on to the community generator fund grants. Councilor Thompson. Resolution be resolved. The, the Council for the Municipality of Canada Victor adopt the following resolution for grants for the Community Generator Fund. East River Valley, East River St. Mary's Fire Department, uh, $3,410. Um, Marsha, which is the American Mish Old School House, $3,557. Lismore and District Recreation, $3,448. And Tony River. Community Center, $4,567 for a total of $14,982 daily. Associate the same day of August 2023. Move on the South Center by Council Tom Hollery. Okay, so you heard the reading of the uh, Community Generator Fund grants, and it's been moved and seconded. Uh, are there any questions on that? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Gains? Uh, so we'll move on now to Councilor Wooden with the vehicle sale tender approval. Resolution Whereas the municipality of the cabin has been given, we should attend for selling three ministry owned vehicles now in the strip service. Be a result of the Council of the Municipality of Canada that built. Accept the following bids from the sale of the vehicles. Dan Fortune for Kevin Fortune, another trend for the other $2,101. Paolo Chislet, 2014 for F-150, $4,325. Janet Hennigan, 2009 Chevrolet, $1,500, $3,000. And the victim of Scotia on his eight day of August, signed by the South, Councilor Devil Wadden, 
I stand for my kids too. I will take the word in a second, but yeah. Uh, Okay, uh, for the reading then of the vehicle, uh, so the state of standards for summer access to uh, all the vehicles. Uh, moved and seconded. Uh, you're seconding that, Councilor Turner? Yep. All those in favor? Aye. Gates, motion carried. Move on to the community connection event policy again, Councilor One. Thank you. I won't read the whole thing, but he was the municipal meeting to come to pick up and up to follow the policy. He is now being found that the community can activity event program policy number 2023-07-17. Purpose is to establish equitable guidelines for the distribution of funds to the not for profit sector and charitable organizations in the community. For the municipality to recognize and support the efforts of the community organizations. Provide cultural, social, environmental, heritage, economic, recreation programs, facilities, and events to the benefit of municipal residents. The objective is to identify an annual basis the amount of funding that the municipality will provide in grants and to establish a process for applying grant money, which is fair and consistently applied, as well as a process by which the municipality will consider grant requests. David Victor Norris going down on the same day of August 2023, signed by myself. Second, sir. Okay, uh, moved and seconded. So just to be sure everybody's aware, this is the one where we have $1,500 per uh, per uh, district put into any uh, events ongoing uh, at any time of year. Uh, and, and that $1,500 can, of course, be broken up with a you know, in, in uh, smaller amounts, if there's more events going on in your district, but that amount was what was set for this year was the um, 18,500 per district. The only thing to be careful of is that uh, if one uh, event or one group gets more than a thousand dollars, then it has to uh, it would be applied for. I know they have to report it. They have to make the application. The county council has to approve it. Whereas if uh, if we have uh, three in your area and you give 500 each, then they don't have to, uh, the council can approve that on their own. Okay, that's the only part I wanted to make clear uh, out of all the, uh, the other regulations that are there. It's meant to help our community, it's what it's meant for. So, uh, any questions on that uh, resolution? Councilor Dave Thank you, uh, Warden. This does not accumulate. Practices. Use it or lose it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, any further questions? Okay. If not, we'll call for the vote. All those in favor? Aye. Against? Motion carried. And so we're going to move on to the mutual aid agreement between the Ernest River Fire Department and the Stacey. And in this county, okay, that's right. And in this county, by department to uh, do with our new highways and fire protection. And Councilor Butler, you're done now. Thank you, Mr. Gordon. We're going to see any finished county buying a volunteer fire department and the Brown River Fire Department have requested that they enter into a mutual aid agreement to improve response time, motor vehicle accidents. Fires and medical emergencies so along the Trans Canada Highway between exit 30 and James River to exit 29 at Barney River. Whereas the Financial Services Committee reviewed the agreement and authorized counsel for the municipality for the county of Petro to enter the agreement. Be it resolved that the Barney River Fire Department enter into a mutual aid agreement with the Anglish County Volunteer, Volunteer Fire Department. And that the agreement is signed by the Ernest River Fire Department, Anglish Fire Department, as well as a representative from the municipality of the county of Petro and the municipality of the county of Anglish. They did at yeah, Petro in Scotia the same day of August in 2023. I'm so moved and seconded by the Councillor Thompson. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded to the resolution to do with the uh, agreement between the Anish uh, County Volunteer Fire Department and the Fire Department to improve safety of the 
priorities and response time, I guess. Are there any questions uh, in terms of that? As we put in the network. Thank you, Mr. Just this is, I think I mean, you have to do this. I think so. Thank you. Sorry. Liability if you don't knock over the MGA, so it's it's the same burn loose around that. So we carry liability of short or something. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we're very long to our sheet value or appointment, Council. Uh, Thank you, Mayor. Oh, sorry, we didn't vote on that one. We're going to have it on the uh, mutual aid agreement. Uh, no concerns, and all those in favor? Aye. Gaines, motion carried. Now we'll move on to the chief guide appointment, Councilor Dewar. Thank you. It's for a resolution where as Section 91 of the Chief Protection Act provides for the annual appointment of chief guides. Therefore, their ass appointments to this office have been made through both the various districts of the county of Pittsburgh. There is, in accordance with the aforementioned statute, of no disclosure that these appointments require the approval of council. Therefore, be it resolved by the municipal council for the municipality of the county of Tecula, the council approves the appointment of the following chief governor for 2021. So that'll be a little different. But it's going to be 23 24. Okay. And it's District 12, Robert McDonald. And dated that Victor Winness is eighth day of August 2022, signed by myself, Councilor Jester Door, and second by Councilor Amy Thompson. So, second. Here we are, pretty sure. I think I've done that one down a little bit. That's good. Uh, okay, is there any uh, questions or concerns on the resolution? Hearing none, we're seeing none. All those in favor? Aye. Thanks, Dr. Gary. And our final one is the church of the documents. Thank you very much, Mr. Warden. Resolution, Rice Municipal Council for the Municipality of the County of Picto has adopted a bylaw which provides for the destruction of any documents or records after they are no longer required for municipal purposes. Whereas the aforementioned bylaw has been approved by the Minister of Municipal Affairs, whereas administrative staff has undertaken a process of reviewing obsolete files with a view to seeking the necessary approval to destroy those which no longer are required in accordance with the destruction of documents of bylaw. Therefore, be it resolved by the Municipal Council, the Municipality of the County of Pinta, the Council authorized destruction of documents described in the attached affidavit of the Municipal Clerk, which indicates that he has potential, uh, personally examined each document or record and confirms that there's nothing of value there and did it depict in Nova Scotia this eighth day of August 2023, signed by myself, Councillor Darwin McKeel, and seconded by Councillor Don Bonner. Second. Okay, uh, so again, we've uh, heard the reading of the motion on the resolution on destruction of documents. Uh, and moved and seconded. Are there any questions on that? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Against? Okay, we move on to the council of government that just left us. Um, and we did discuss this while we were here, uh, the future of coal burning plants. Uh, I think we still should follow that up with a uh, with letter so that it's on record. And the only, uh, somebody, I can't make it, but somebody needs to make a motion or go to make a motion. The only thing I think that has to be clarified is. Uh, Plant from coal burning to oil burning. They mentioned here diesel and other uh, fuels that would be very more acceptable uh, in my mind than a cup of seed for sure. So uh, whoever makes a motion can word it the way they want, uh, but I, I think it should say coal burning, not go to bunker C is what we're looking at here. So is there anybody interested in making that motion? Motion. Okay. The motion that they were made in the, uh, I guess we we want to put it that we don't want to burn a bumper sheet or anything that's going to cause more harm to the atmosphere than it's already done by the coal. Okay, uh, so you can uh, raise that something there, but it's basically what we don't think is not not bumper sheet. Yeah. 
whether it's a flame bar or a so bar or something, it's a, it's a different matter. The only thing they're talking about is to have that quick energy when you need it. You, know, you flip on a switch and have an oil blower at the heat in no time. But you can't do that with a seat. Uh, you have to heat the you take the other oil burner to get the bucket of seat, you know, it's not enough to, uh, to blow even. You know, that stuff in order. It's uh, terrible stuff. So, uh, so you, you may end up with a motor that's bigger and who's that it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you can you can have that motion and be here and who's second? it? Just a second. Okay, so any discussion on that? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Here. Thank you. Uh, now we're moving on to uh, the latest uh, one from the province, which uh, we had a discussion online. Some people were on, uh, some couldn't make it, but uh, this has been worked on for a long time by the committee of NSFM and, uh, and the province. Looking at service exchange, which has been looked at for 25 years uh, or longer, since 1995, I think it would be more than 25 years. So, as with a lot of things, sometimes the devil's in the details. And so we need to, but obviously we need a new service exchange agreement, the only one way of the date, but uh, I'm going to let Brian uh, lead us through this, and uh, probably at some point going to be just a lot of questions, but we, want, we need this panel, so I guess to we'll have a chance to uh, to discuss this together in the uh, sessions for uh, input. Uh, learning and in what I guess are coming up uh, starting this week. I think it's always 10th since the first. Uh, they're all online, you know, all the learning sessions. You can go to any one you want. Uh, one of them is only in French. So you might, uh, you might be, you might have to look at them. Uh, but the others, they're all going to be the same thing. But uh, I did notice that there's two meetings that the transportation people that are just on the province. Are going to be attended to two of them. So, if you're particularly concerned about road issues, uh, then uh, those may be the ones to attend. But I think that everybody received the dates of those uh, consultation sessions. Everybody got those? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Brian, do you want to lead us through uh, this year? Uh, it's, not, it's not final. It's, you know, it's say after the consultations. We can change them, but they really do want to push it through in a hurry this fall. And otherwise, they figure they're going to miss the opportunity because the elections come next fall of the spring. They really want to do it this fall, although I think they, they may find that they're limiting opportunity uh, too much for councils to have the chance to uh, have them say. So I'll let you go ahead and go. Um, so really, there's six categories that they're looking at. Um, funding shifts, so the municipal financial capacity grant, that's what's coming in for people's equalization, so a new formula. Um, being put into place, the details of uh, uh, what's included in that. Second page. Um, so in essence, we currently receive two hundred seventy thousand. We will drop to one seventy two. They're basically saying they will top that up for a five year period. So you won't lose anything for five years, but then just year five, you'll go to whatever the amount of the formula comes at that point. Um, and that can fluctuate some on an annual basis, just based on the various inputs that go into. Um, corrections, the province to see yeah, cost of corrections, uh, which would save us two or there with a thousand. Uh, Office of schools, uh, province was in ownership of all schools that began to 1981. So that could end up as well, basically. Impact down the road, but it's also an unknown number. Did they first write down? Housing, um, the province will absorb the annual cost associated with public housing losses. Uh, so this will save from this probably 66,000. Infrastructure funding, they're creating a new grant 
kind of a program which is application based. Um, that it's basically coming to the provincial increase. Um, that you could access uh, leverage money uh, there. So it's fifteen hundred dollars starting with forty nine municipalities. Uh, and one of the comments I think that was in the slide deck that ends up and said no, um, was that it could use the leverage um, if you were to get program under the ICP program, that it could be used as a municipal contribution um, towards that. So in essence, the province would pay um, in essence Maximum federal government would pay would be 50%. So the province could pay up to 50%. But the sporting loan is found as for 15 million. Really, no detail around if it's a merit based application or if it's uh, something else. And then the big one is roads. The province will create two application based funding programs for roads. Uh, Spring May, six million will be available for cost share paving of Trump state routes, which are in the split mode. Uh, so that's typically what's in the tenders, uh, in material terms, in tenders. And then stream B, 10 million will be available for GHI and J class roads and municipalities have an interest in containing. Um, it's pretty big. Um, and the slide deck um, from the SFM was one gray area there. Um, it, it talks about the municipalities are interested in only. Um, it also talks about that. If a road is currently paved, uh, province and it doesn't meet their safety standards, they will return it to uh, dirt. Um, it just seems there, and then they have the caveat in that if the municipality is interested in taking it over, it seems a lot of pressure coming from residents when they hear, oh, our road's going to turn back to gravel. That's then going to come to the municipality. You're going to be put in the position of uh, basically saying, well, we're not interested in taking it over. So it's clever. So I guess a way to potentially get permits to uh, a municipality. But there's a lot of things within this, this whole early thing. It does talk about the a two for one credit. Um, he said, hey, I go back to 1995. I go back five years. What does that mean? So, so right now we have about 30 farmers of what are deemed J class roads. Now that list is not all J class. It would be some of these other classes. But 30 farmers um, there. Um, this is by far the the biggest liability. Yeah, so they were so it's kind of where they're at. Um, I think that there are a lot of details, especially on the roads that we really think. Um, it, it talks about the municipal interest in taking it over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. Uh, so the this is an overview that Brian just given us of something that's going to be a lot more work done on it before all this consultation for the next phase, and they're hoping that uh, they get it approved. But if there's too much resistance from the various municipalities, then it won't get approved in time to go to the fall session. But, uh, said that they're worried they won't be able to get it through next year, but there's a whole lot of other stuff that they didn't really get to that was a big long list of them, it's probably eight or one, but Big long list of things that possible future things they don't want to read in 25 years to deal with. But uh, 
But there's definitely an interest in uh, moving on the roads from the town's point of view and get some of these truck roads to go into the middle of their town looked after by the province. But in our case, most of the trunks and the number of roads and stuff are looked after by the province anyway. Uh, it's all these other roads that we have a massive number of them that uh, if we were to take over the amount of those roads, we would need a department of public works and we're dealing with the you know, to get, to get all the work done, which you're talking a lot of uh, a lot of expense. So the, uh, I think it's the uh, CAO said there may be some uh, hidden motives uh, here somewhere. It does look good at the service that we're going to get. housing one's going to be gone. The, you know, the prison one's going to be gone. A couple others, but they might be minimal if we uh, get into looking at the uh, cost on the road. So I just wanted to open it up for a discussion. Is there anybody who has? Any feelings at this point, or do you want to wait until the consultation takes place? Thank you, Governor. Good morning. I'm just on the roads, and I read that presentation on two minutes. I think you sent it out earlier. Yeah. 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 Yeah
uh, because he was on that committee uh, then on the roads part of the thing and uh, oh, I, but he was away on vacation until today and it was apparently was a that didn't make out so somebody that's sort of on the inside there that knows a little more of because this is so bad you can't really make any any comments are made the decision thoughts and again maybe they left it deliberately made so the people would attend the information sessions and try to get more there but I think the deputy minister he made it very clear uh, during a uh, question that was asked or that the Zoom meeting or there we can we can move when we want to. Uh, we're we're being nice and top of here. We can move when we want to I think but, uh, his point was uh, and Lady White's on the community as well. Yeah, do you want to touch base with somebody? So there are a couple of people that we can try and find a little more, but I, I certainly recommend to everybody around the table to try and attend at least one of those uh, sessions. And the big part of the month where the Department uh, of Transportation people are going to be there. Uh, Councilor Dave Bear. First of all, I received from Council of Palm this evening a list of roads um, might be subject to this to be transferred to the happy. You should have that with the bathroom. Yeah, I'll get the list. Yeah, yeah it's, it, it, it's, it's firstly every road in the county is on a four and then the it will make our customer our traffic that probably quite a book. And I'm a firm believer that thou shalt not beggar thy neighbor. Making my neighbor poor doesn't help me. Okay, and yet, you have many small towns that are lobbying for this. Okay, and I'll use the West Coast example. West Coast in the tough spot. That much commercial or industrial tax schools. They have a lot of very crummy streets. We have a lot of roads. Let's go on. I'm not sure anything. That county has more roads than any other county in this province. I believe that's probably true. We have a lot. Yeah, some of them have been abandoned here. There's still a ton of them. Uh, it's, it's not possible to compare, and I had this discussion with our yesterday. We looked at many of the uh, regulations, the subdivision of HRN. You take a subdivision in 10 town that has 50 homes on Columbia that generates 25 or 30 million dollars. Compare that to a gravel road in my district. I get five homes that generates maybe. Maybe a million dollars for this and it's ten times longer. Uh, it's just no comparison. This will bank us. need to make that very clear. And push through when I say so. It helps West Fulton. That's not easy to measure us. And you should not measure that neighbor. If your neighbor's doing well, they can that flown your way. If your neighbor's very poor, they're not going to be a lot We need to talk to the whites of the world and say, this is not the company. This is only going to hurt us in, in a very real way. Uh, this is just something that we have to do. Everything we can have to propose to the shorty of the drink. We look down the list that my sent to me. I feel the pick the least, and then I have to pick the west, obviously. Um, maybe more than that. But it's just, it just decimates his own position. Just decimates. Okay. Um, I'll give you an example. Obviously, you noticed today, I mentioned before, bridge over Skinner Brook, which owns the boundary between the town of Westville and the county of Pecto. They don't close that bridge because it hasn't been maintained. Now, I'm just going to put up a barrier so that their vehicles will not cross that bridge. Who maintains that? On the end of what we call the Walls Road. We did that. We did not have it on. Oh, it's on bridge. It's a structure. 29 feet, 6 inches wide. I bet you the structure on bridge. It's 17 feet. That's higher than the ceiling above the water. It's an enormous cost. Randy's point. 
bring that one up to stand. And that's been happy as well. It's just very fair or drunk. Uh, this is the most dangerous proposal that I have seen when he was on council. Okay, anybody else wants to speak on this tonight? Anybody? So I think we'll there are steps here to follow, and uh, we need to make our opinions well known for sure, whether it's on these uh, consultation sessions or afterwards. I'm not sure if they're two way or one way the consultation sessions. And, uh, please try and attend some. It's a very difficult time. This point was made the uh, rear row by some of these hands, but I'll talk about others on the new meeting. Not a good time to have all the meetings in August. A lot of people are away and, and don't have a, an opportunity maybe to have their input. But again, they do want to rush this through if at all possible. Uh, they feel that the only way to do that is by having these meetings uh, in August. Okay, we're going to move on. Uh, so 10A uh, is a donation to Magnet's Place, and I'll let Council go on and speak to this. Yes, Victor County is also one of the finest young communal counselors, and we're all excited to hear her making some time in passing earlier this month. Megan was an ambitious and energetic young lady who responded as a municipal government as her opportunity to make a difference. I was fortunate to work with Megan during the early years of our MAP committee, and she was a public health representative. And I remember when she decided to put her name forward for the election in 2020, she very did anticipate making some fluid municipal decisions for her town. In the county in general. She brought an admission platform to her table and she remained on her committee after she selected. I also had the opportunity to three past years to work with Megan on her library board. She demonstrated the same energy and the sport that she showed with all her endeavors. Above all else, she was a loving mother to her daughter, Ellie. She grew up a young single mother who work out of the home full time and still be excellent counselors. Equity and accessibility were her passions. So the town of Westville is asking donations for me to help create naked space, recreation space that is inclusive and accessible to all. So I would like to make a motion to contribute $1,000 to this very important project, honoring the life that was taken by the school. I'll second that. And it moves to the second it. Brian, can you take over for a minute? Yeah. I just want to make a few comments myself. Uh, I got to know Megan pretty good over the last couple of years because she served on our crisis mental health working group. We had one representative from each municipality, and uh, I think the mayor of Westville recognized that she was the right person to have there. Uh, just a, a very special person who, uh, her smile when she walked into the room, just put it really needs. Uh, you know, she, she had a way of, of dealing with people that wasn't with a loud voice. Uh, but I, I always said she she thought a lot before she spoke. And that's probably something for us to learn, learn more of. But she you know, would sit quietly for a while and then speak up. And But in the last two years, we've probably uh, made more headway than we did in the previous three. Uh, with the uh, crisis mental health working group, which really aimed at helping people come in there in the hospital who are in crisis and perhaps in danger of taking their own lives or others. And uh, they have a lot of compassion uh, for people in general, but uh, especially for people uh, suffering through mental health issues. And uh, just, it's unbelievable to me uh, that we went to the conference, uh, the NSFM conference in uh, Davie back in early May. And I remember they had the casino night there trying to fill time in, you know, between the two days. And uh, she was there just as healthy as any of the rest of us in the island having a good time. Uh, and uh, well, I've got some terrible cancer and uh, takes her in a very short time. Uh, I mean, it was early a month that, uh, you know, that she'd been treated. And then she called the mayor of Westville and said, I have one to two weeks left. I have the courage just to call him and tell, tell him that. Uh, but again, a very special person. Uh, she lost her father at exactly the same age. who was in MLA at that time in the uh, provincial government. Uh, you know, and so uh, unfortunately, you know, it came along, grabbed her, and you know, her daughter left. Uh, well, she had a lot of family to take care of her, but she left with her mom. So uh, I fully agree uh, with this motion. And uh, 
Did she she knew of the, this request uh, ahead of time when the planning calendar voted and she was part of it. And the very brave young lady who faced this, uh, you know, unflinchingly almost. But, uh, I think it's uh, the least we can do is to make a contribution as uh, it's going to go Thank you. Okay, Question. is is there further um, any further comments or questions on the motion? Go ahead, Councilor Lee. Okay, so we'll uh, actually call all those in favor. Aye. Aye. Okay, now we'll move to another difficult one. Uh, condolences uh, for West Ham. So, Councilor Lee, where are you from? Would that? I would. Uh, thank you, Mr. Wood. As you're all aware, uh, a couple weeks ago, we had a, another severe weather event, this case, uh, heavy, heavy rain. And in the uh, municipality of West Hand, this town, Windsor Town, uh, they lost four. Their residents, two small children, six years old, and 14 on the coach recovered. Just recently, uh, kind of floundered away, and uh, a well known 52 year old musician. We talk about Nova Scotia Strong, we talk about being resilient. So how are we resilient? Well, one way we're resilient is when we reach out to those who are hurting, to those who are suffering, we tell them we suffer with them. That's why I like to send a letter. That's why the West Hands from this part of the county Pecto saying share your grief and hope we wish for a better turn uh, for the recovery from this. Uh, Okay, uh, so we moved and seconded that we send a letter of condolences uh, to uh, the municipality of uh, West Hans uh, for uh, the loss of, of lives uh, in uh, the recent uh, flooding and storm there. Any uh, questions or interesting to we'll go ahead and talk to people? Not, not just the loss of lives, but the damage there. there is. Well, lives can't be replaced. The infrastructure can't will eventually be replaced. Said, you suffer, we suffer. Okay. Uh, any other questions, concerns? I don't see any, so we'll call for a vote on that motion. All those in favor? Aye. 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 I've had a door about in this one. So. <laughs> okay. Anyway, I just want to should know that these medical care turns out for 21 years, and from 1972 to 2002, and it will come back this August 16th to August 20th. We had a great group of volunteers meet once in two weeks, successfully so talked. A lot of people very enthusiastic in place of that. A lot of talk about how, how great it is that we're to come back. Um, so there's going to be a pickleball tournament, there's going to be a children's parade, there's going to be a team dance, a children's dance, children's parade. Game of chance, which for the kids, entertainment, fireworks, golf dance, of course, the street went great on Sundays. The, uh, the list, the schedule was sent to the Muscovic Post. So, anyway, I just want to, as you all know, but, uh, but he's excited about one of our areas. So, so he's somebody that. And the events that you listed, Council Brother, did you list the Jack Tank and the Pastor? The uh, Tank is there and uh, they have choice. They have choice. One's that? Which bomb? Which bomb? Oh, it's Saturday afternoon. Saturday. Yes, I did. Sometimes Saturday. I think we're going to have a good thing to say. 
Okay, do we have any further community announcements tonight? Go ahead, John, for one. Just to remind you that the uh, Art Brown Project annual stand flight simulator tickets are still available if you're on the program. August 20th from 3 to 6 in the TV in particular. The CA Fire Department will also buy your tickets on the phone. That's the annual tickets. Twenty-five, and, and did you say that was at the community center or the fire? Oh, the community center was fire department. Okay, it's the community center. It's Robert Shelton. Okay, David, how's the day for? So the report of one and now the next one. Last Saturday evening, fifth of August, at the Fraser event for Hern and Pleasant Valley. The um, they graciously hosted a adult dance. Uh, it was successful. I haven't heard the money numbers yet. There was a silent option. Fifty, and of course, uh, mission at the door. But uh, there wasn't a huge crowd. It was rainy that night. We lost a few of the younger people to do believe, but we didn't have as good a busy plan on this anyway. But it was successful, and we're planning to do something. Uh, probably on the 17th of September, which is the weekend after the exhibition, um, at hopefully the same venue, and will be more oriented towards children and younger families. Probably like a barbecue, we can compete to prepare to dance, and also get some lots of cash games there, and so on. That's so tangible, that is the 17th of September. And it will be, I think we're looking at about six. 10 or maybe even 5 to 9. The evening is compared to a later evening. Thank you. Okay. Any further community announcements for a township Uh This past week, or I guess it was last week, um, Sean Frazier came up to Sunny Bray and, and gave some good news to a rural community that needed a little lift after uh, lost her church last year after Fiona. Um, and only building they have left in the in a public gathering spot in the community is the uh, McDonald Rebecca Lodge. And he announced $100,000 towards the upgrades to that hall, along with the contribution from the municipality, which is close to 24000 and uh, some other uh, funds. Uh, there's a generator going into the building as well. So. Right now, it's about one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. It's going to be invested in, in uh, um, Sunny Bray in the southeastern section of uh, Pickle County. Uh, residents up there are excited. They're happy to have a little bit of attention, and uh, look forward to work starting soon. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other? Seeing none, I just want to remind people and my brother David and Pence for the exhibition. Uh, we will have uh, probably our September meeting before that, but uh, we get pretty close by that time. And it is a difficult year for the exhibition. I don't know the Fraser was a leader uh, you know, in many aspects of that. And uh, so keep them in, in your mind and uh, anything that uh, we can do in our various communities to help our forage, to help agriculture. So, Always a good thing, and there's a lot of people trying to keep that exhibition going. And uh, they're like every other group, they're aging out. Uh, you know, hopefully, uh, some younger people uh, are going to step in there. Some already have, but uh, some of the leaders uh, are you know, having a tough time this year. As I said, I'm very grateful for the big part of the, of the organization. So, if there's no uh, further community announcements, uh, we come to the end of the script, so I uh, declare the meeting adjourned. Thank you all for coming. Yeah. 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 Yeah.